Hello, folks. Just a little bit after 10. Uh, we have a great session and I'm excited to jump into it. So I want to make sure that we get started as time uh, on time, even though a few people are still filtering in from uh, from the waiting room or joining us for today's session. Uh, welcome. I am Martin Daly. I'm the director of water quality programs for the Capital District Regional Planning Commission. I also serve on my community's uh, Board of Zoning Appeals. So that's why I'm particularly excited about this session today. Today's webinar is Not in My Backyard, Community Opposition to Land Use Applications. And joining me today is Ms. Libby Carreno. Ms. Carreno is a real estate development attorney who provides counsel to applicants on land use applications before local and state uh, review boards, as well as project finance and land acquisition. She maintains a small boutique private law practice focused solely on real estate development, complex commercial finance, and HOA and condo issues. Before we begin, I got to do a little bit of housekeeping. For those of you that do not know us, CDRPC is a regional planning and resource center that serves Albany, Rensselaer, Saratoga, and Schenectady counties. We foster intergovernmental cooperation, communicating, collaborating, and facilitating regional initiatives. And we work with partners to help them address regional problems. This webinar series was established to help planners sharpen their skills and provide a vehicle for planning and zoning board of appeals members to obtain their credit hours. Planning and Zoning Board of Appeals members are required by state statute to obtain four hours of training a year, and municipalities have a wide latitude in defining what training is acceptable for credit. After each webinar in the series, each attendee that registered with an email address will receive an email confirming your attendance, and this email may be submitted to your municipality for consideration of credit. If you don't receive the email, uh, let someone at CDRPC know. Uh, we can certainly check the log of attendees and be able to provide you with something that you may need to submit to your municipality for credit. In addition, for those of you that are practicing AICP certified planners, we have submitted this session for 1.5 hours of law CM to the APA. And I believe that's up on the APA website now for you to be able to, uh, to log in. Our attendees join with audio and video off for security purposes. Uh, not to be a distraction, but we have a large audience and we really hope to engage in a spirit of dialogue. So I can unmute attendees to allow them to ask questions directly. Uh, just give me a heads up in the chat box if you'd like to ask a question in person and I will unmute you, put your video up, whichever you prefer, and you can ask that question. Alternatively, you can just type your question into the chat box and sort of like a radio DJ, I will um, pick a spot and uh, I'll ask Libby your question. Yes, we will archive presentation material. That's the number one question we get. Uh, the PDFs of the presentation will be archived on the Eventbrite site. That's the same site you used to register for your webinars. Shameless plug for future webinars. They are also there. You can um, sign up for future webinars. Any past webinar, archive material is right there in one spot. We are recording this and the recordings will be posted to CDRPC's YouTube channel at the conclusion of the series. We will email everyone to let you know that those video archive recordings are available uh, for you to watch at any time, but they will be available at the conclusion of the series and things wrap up on June 2nd. So we got a little time there. So let's get to it. I've gotten to, everybody knows where the fire exits are. I can move on into the session description, <laughs> which is where I'm meeting for my notes. Uh, today's session is not in my backyard, community opposition to land use applications. It's not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood anymore. We're gonna have an open discussion that will address the legal fine points of ever-changing role of NIMBYism in land use review and YIMBYism, uh, yes, in my backyard. The rise of social media information, FOIL, and legal standing. And I'm really excited to have Libby here. She is a bona fide expert in these matters. She is returning to us because her session is uh, probably one of the most popular and uh, the, the sessions that get the most demand. So I'm very excited that you're joining us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Libby to present. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm so grateful to be back. I always enjoy these, though. I do have to say that it has been such an adjustment to try to do these over Zoom because I can't see everyone and, and we don't get to have the same engagement. But one of the things that I have done is um, submitted the materials um, uh, in narrative form, sort of a case summary, so that if we don't get to everything, those materials are available, so that if we don't get to every case, you can read about them. So I'm gonna encourage everyone, um, instead of saving your questions to the end, um, so that we ensure we get to every case, because they're in your materials, ask your questions as we go, um, because that's sort of more helpful from a timing perspective. So if something comes up and you wanna ask, 
you know, please go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. I know Martin's going to help me uh, keep track of questions as they come up. So I don't mm -hmm. miss anything because there's just a lot to keep track of with the computer. So um, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I think this is the right one. Um, yeah, working off multiple monitors. <laughs> yeah. So I project the right one. Right. Otherwise, everybody's <laughs> reading your email. <laughs> I hope not. So do I have... You can see it. Yes. Thank you. So we have the right one up. So um, so the reason that this, this issue is becoming more and more important is because um, what's showing up, at least in the case law, as we see the decisions and about, you know, give or take every year, obviously 2020 is going to be a completely different year when it comes to case law review because the courts were shut down for such a long period of time. But on the average, we see about 100 to 150 land use decisions a year out of the four departments, um, notwithstanding the Court of Appeals and the trial, that's the highest court in New York, and the trial level decisions at the Supreme Court level, which is our lowest level court in New York, um, notwithstanding the, lo the uh, local municipal courts. Um, so right out of the appellate divisions, we have four across the state, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. Um, up here in the Capital District, since this is Capital, uh, Capital District Regional Planning Commission, CDRPC, we're in the third department, but the cases we'll talk about today come all across the state. Um, but out of those, we see about 100 to 150 on the average every year. And what we're seeing in the cases that have been coming out is this rise in where the information um, on, upon which boards are making their decisions, where is it, where is it being where is it coming from? In the, in the world of lawyer parlance, we call that uh, building the record. So where in the record did the information originate upon which the board is making its decision or that it's relying upon? And because of the last 25 years or not even 25 years, but really the last 15 years, the proliferation of available online resources, uh, not, with just, not, not with just the internet, but the ability to have online dialogue and where those conversations are happening um, with sort of the public square in the form of social media has drastically altered um, what those conversations look like. And so where a public hearing um, at one time in the 1970s, you know, would have been in, um, you know, city hall or town hall, uh, where everyone would come and there, there was no simulcasting or multicasting or whatever uh, closed circuit TV or whatever we, we can use now, let alone Zoom. Uh, those types of things were not available. We, uh, we gathered and uh, the hearing was, <clears throat> was held, either transcribed or minutes were taken. That was how it was done. And so, you know, fast forward 50 years, we're in a dra drastically different place. And so because of that, the way in which decisions are being made and the way in which information is coming to boards is changing. And so um, that's why it's so important to also track how are, how are the courts looking at that same change or that same uh, period of time. And so kind of as, as the courts kind of call balls and strikes, what's in and what's out um, as the public square has changed. So if a conversation is happening outside of town hall or city hall, um, and is happening in the public square, but sort of the quasi public square now, which is sort of the um, online uh, social media space, how is that going to be treated or how is that considered? And so those types of things are incredibly important and they're new. And I don't know for many of, um, many of, the, of the volunteers and the people who serve on our local boards, whether that be a zoning board, a planning board, uh, an architectural board, a design review board, a the list goes on and on. Um, but if you are, you know, if, if we are doing public service, which which most um, most of us are who, who do serve most of the people uh, that I appear before are public servants are doing a public good, probably don't wake up every day reading 150 of the land use decisions to see what's happened in the public square of the last hundred or the last 50 years. And I understand that. So um, so that's why I think some of these presentations are so important, because who would know these things, who would be tracking. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, that's why we're here to talk about um, uh, if information does come to you through um, social media, if information is being, uh, you know, uh, is proliferating through the internet, what does that mean and how, how can you consider it? So these are, and the way that we're going to go through this today and the way that we're going to talk about this today is through some what I, what I like to call sort of teachable cases, sort of what has the court seen and how has it treated it 
um, from everything from FOIL to public meetings to the standard of review at zoning and planning um, to sort of just give examples and sort of set the framework or the, sort of the outer edges of what the courts have seen um, over really, I think my earliest case in the materials is 2013. So kind of looking at about an eight year, seven to eight year span. All right. So let's see if I can advance my slide. Uh, doesn't want to, let's see here. There we go. So the first topic we're gonna to come to is this, this idea that I talk about called subjective public opinion. And this, this concept um, is gonna to come to us through um, this case out of the city of New Rochelle and its ZBA called Marina's Edge Owners Corp. And um, I'm, you know what I'm gonna to have to do? There's a, can't see all of my stuff. So I'm gonna to have to minimize my are here. Sorry, everybody. No one can see what I'm doing, but I'm narrating my own behavior. Uh, sorry about that. Um, okay. So um, in this particular case, um, what was occurring uh, was the applicant owned a 211 co-op unit building with 160 on-site parking spaces for the owners. And sort of next to it was this unimproved adjacent lot um, to the building. And so they wanted to add 28 um, parking spaces. And so this kind of comes to us as a zoning application. Um, and so they, uh, the sorry, so the zoning applicable to the property is two family and provides for a maximum of four off street parking spaces. And the empty lot has this eight foot fence around it. And so it blocks the view to Long Island Sound. And so already right out of the gate, anything that blocks views, we know um, just through sort of our anecdotal experience um, is something that generally has community concern, right? So views and trees and things that are generally thought of as sort of community assets or, or aesthetic assets tend to be things that we think of as being public concern or things that generally um, arouse public interest. So, um, so the applicant applies for this building permit and it's denied and he has to go back and ask for this area variance. So following a hearing, the ZBA denies the area variance due to, and its sites. so for those of you who are sitting on D ZBAs, you know that one of the five-part tests for ZBA is an undesirable change in the character of the surrounding neighborhood or area, and the grounds for that uh, failure of the test was because of a negative aesthetic and visual impact on nearby properties, so this uh, eight-foot fence. And in reversing this denial, the second department, which is down, down by Long Island, second department handles everything outside of New York City and then kind of up to about Dutchess County. Uh, the second department recited the ZBA, recited that the ZBA failed to clearly set forth how and in what manner the variance would be improper. Rather, and this is a direct quote, the ZBA was presented with the subjective objections and general community opposition of the neighboring property owners, most of whom expressed their subjective opinions as to the negative aesthetics of a parking lot. Furthermore, there was no objective basis upon which to conclude that the petitioner had a feasible alternative to the requested variance. So the question that this case raises is, how were a couple of extra parking spaces going to alter a neighborhood where a similar parking, um, sort of similar parking occurred on the adjacent lot? So, here, what I wanted to sort of, what I, I think this is such a great teachable case, mostly because of the court's language um, for uh, really instructive to ZBAs about the difference between subjective and objective opinions. And when we're talking about subjective opinions or subjective objections, what we're really talking about there is do you, and I try to give it this way, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm obviously not trying to be glib, but we're really talking about, do you like the Picasso or don't you? Are you more of a Manet or a Monet person? Because those types of opinions are in the eye of the beholder. And in fact, there was a pretty famous case written um, by a Supreme Court justice, uh, I think it was in the 1960s and it was the pornography case and it, and it had to do with sort of the, um, uh, you know, how do you define um, you know, something that is, you know, objectionably offensive. And at the U.S. Supreme Court, the judge wrote, I, I don't know, but I'll know it when I see it. I think that's people, uh, there's a movie, it's like People versus Larry Flint. 
Right, right. Yeah. So that's actually, that, that actually appeared, it, that's how hard it is. I mean, so I bring that up because I wanted to give some, um, some validation that if the U.S. Supreme Court struggles <laughs> with identifying things that are of a subjective nature, then it would be natural at the ZBA to struggle with that. So it's not that it's abnormal to struggle with that. If it is a struggle, it's usually because it's based in some type of subjective analysis. So what is what is subjectively aesthetically a problem for one person isn't for another. And so that's why it's so, so objective has much more to do with something grounded in the record, something that can be pointed to as empirically evidence based. So an example for that in this circumstance, you know, and of course I wasn't the lawyer on this case, I always like to say that. And I will say very transparently that I have been in presentations where the lawyers have been in my audience and they are very free to share with me what I get right and wrong about what they saw in the case. So if that's, if that's happening here, I'm happy to sort of, you know, take those and chat about it because I, you know, I only can glean what I can see from the record, but. I have a, I have a question from our audience. Yeah, of um, course. In referring to the application, it was a, you described as a couple of extra parking space, the facility, mm -hmm. 28 space facilities, uh, 28 space facility, were they seeking a variance for, for more than a parking maximum that was allowed? Yeah, it was a parking maximum. It was, it was to, it was to add more than the parking that was allowed. And it was to just be, to be very clear for the, the ZBA members, mm -hmm. it was similar park. It was a similar parking configuration to an, a lot across the street that had a very similar parking setup, which is actually what I think really rubbed the second department the wrong way was that there was really no distinguishable difference between the lot across the street and this one that had been given the bump in parking spaces. And so, yeah. um, and so what happened here was because there wasn't anything other than, I just don't like the way that looks, um, you know? And so here, and, and the other really important note here about the no objective basis upon which to conclude that the petitioner has a, had a feasible alternative. I've actually seen a rise in this particular analysis, specifically the second department, but it's creeping up here too, that um, the more fantastical, the feasible alternative that people come up with, it really does have to be grounded in fact. Um, the human imagination is limitless. I mean, we could imagine, and I don't, and again, I don't say this to be flippant. I say it to just sort of prove the point. I mean we could set up wind turbines on Mars. I mean, we could do that, That's a, but it's not feasible. It's an alternative, but we really do, if, if there is a feasible alternative, that feasibility is a key word in the analysis. And I see courts really starting to hone in on that. They wanna see the objective basis for the feasibility of the alternative, not just an alternative. And you'll see later on, I'll bring up a case where not building the project is not an alternative, <laughs> just so everybody knows. You know, couldn't you just not build it? Um, that's not an alternative. So there's those types of things that you, you kind of see. So um, so I just wanted to, to bring that one up because I think that um, as we look at uh, what the courts are going to look for with respect to, um, to evidence, because at the end of the day, ZBAs are quasi-judicial bodies, which I know is different than the planning board. And sometimes I think it's hard to, for those who, um, to, uh, for those who sit on ZBAs to really understand that their cases, their decisions are, are quasi-judicial and they're reviewed that way, reviewed based upon a record. So for a, a ZBA, I know not building the project isn't a feasible alternative. Oftentimes yeah. there are questions like, do you actually need the variance? Is there a configuration that would eliminate the necessity of the variance altogether? Obviously oh, there's, yes. there's a struggle with minimizing the variance, but that's a question for the ZBA to, to ask the applicant. Is there any other way to deliver this project feasibly without requiring a variance? You must have seen my materials because there's a case. I, I didn't look through it. We have, there's a case in here on that. A shout out Actually, to our ZBA. I, I we think, have a good ZBA. <laughs> no, I think Tompkins County did this and it's in here and they did it well. So it's a teachable case and we'll get to it in a few minutes. But Awesome. Okay. Sorry to yeah, leave you on that There is a place in the middle and I brought that one with me and they did, it, they did a great job with it. All right. So let me see if I can advance mine. I don't know. There we go. This is my next one. This is Quintana 
versus the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Incorporated Village of Mutton Town. I don't know where that is. If anybody knows where that is, uh, I've never looked this up. Um, but again, same kind of thing. Here, we don't have a tremendous number of facts. Um, that tends to happen with ZBA cases, but essentially, this is a lot depth variance. So the lot isn't deep enough to build what the applicant wants to build. And, um, and so they need an area variance. And so the, the zoning board cites to self-created hardship and substantiality in denying the area variance. And the applicant files an article 78 um, based upon the, the board's failure to apply the entire five-part five test, uh, the balancing test. And so both of the Supreme Court, that's the lower level, and the second department found that the board's decision to deny the variance was arbitrary and capricious because there was no evidence of impact on the remaining three parts of the test. One, an undesirable change in the neighborhood. Two, adverse impact on the physical envir and environmental conditions. And three, detriment to the health, safety, and welfare of the neighborhood. But here's the important part. The court went on, not they're all important, but just the part that's really important to um, this sort of community impact aspect. The court went on to point out that the information relied on by the board was irrational as it rested largely again on subjective considerations of general community opposition. And so again, here we see that the, um, the, what the court is saying, what it saw from its record was that it couldn't find evidence, meaning empirical, tangible, objective evidence that supported the findings other than this kind of opinion-based or subjective-based public square type of opposition to the project. And so that's going to continue to be the theme throughout this presentation is that the courts are really signaling to boards that, that there's this requirement to grab a thread. There has to be a thread, a, a causal connection, so to speak, between the impact that's being cited and evidence in the record. Because without that, it is a disconnected or an unconnected connection or a causal connection between cause and effect. And the court is gonna be looking for those two things. And then here again, as I said, this, this rise in feasible alternative analysis. Um, furthermore, the feasible alternative cited by the board had no rational basis within the record. So here again, we see this, that the feasibility, not the alternative, but it wasn't feasible. It wasn't rational. It didn't make sense. Um, but this case represents a rare but important check on a zoning board's ability to fairly balance all factors in an area variance test and not weight them as if under the use variance standards. And I bring this up, so for my ZBA members out there, you know this, um, the way that the use and area variance tests are done are different in the sense that uh, a use variance is all or nothing. You fail one test, you're out. But, a Z, but an area variance is a balancing test, three out of five. Um, is okay, two out of five isn't. So here, what the, what the ZBA failed to do was essentially from the overall context of reading this decision is the ZBA listened to some testimony and really heard some opposition to this lot depth variance. My guess is it's probably a substandard lot and the neighbors were really upset about it. And instead of, um, citing to you know evidence in the record and really making those causal connections picked out two aspects of the area variance test cited to those and voted it down and on for two reasons that's insufficient one is the evidence wasn't there and two they didn't apply the full test so on both grounds it was uh, insufficient so that's that's why all right so moving to the next I'm, all right, so I think now I'm gonna sort of talk about how would you remedy those types of things. So this is objective opinion. I am um, in my sort of um, sort of Libby Carino parlance say, I call this objection plus one. Um, this is the matter of Bonefish Grill versus the ZBA of the village of Rockville Center. So Bonefish um, achieves its approval uh, its building permit requires that the lot next door, um, so this is one of its sort of extra jurisdictional requirements, be merged with the restaurant lot 
Otherwise, a parking variance would be required. So the grill applies for its certificate of occupancy. The building department notes the merger had not taken place. So Bonefish enters into this licensing agreement, which was allowed with the adjoining lot to be used for parking from 4 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. to thereby satisfy this overage of parking. The building department refers the matter to the zoning board for a hearing on a parking variance. The DBA imposes the conditions um, uh, and impose as, as conditions the terms of the licensing agreement by li limiting the hours of operation and requiring valley parking. So the court reviews this and finds that the conditions were reasonable. Now here's why. Because the, ex the expert traffic engineer's comments and the ZBA's members, ZBA members' knowledge of high parking demand in that impact in that area and the impact to surrounding businesses were all found within the record. So they could be cited to um, as empirical data upon which the zoning board could rely. So it was an objection plus one, plus evidence, meaning that objection was grounded in the record. And here it was actually plus three. I saw you come on, so is there something? I, yeah, when you see me pop up, it's like, I have a question. Like that, okay. like that I may be dating myself, like that clipboard, the clippy thing when you're- Oh, like, I remember from Word. <laughs> <laughs> they got rid of that fast. It was like, looks <laughs> like you're writing a note. I can help. Um, I can help. I, uh, I'm not here to help, I'm here to ask questions. Um, the, so really great question from our audience. And I love this one, because it goes back to the subjectivity and the first part of the five-part test, which goes yeah. to community character. And the question is, particularly the reference to neighborhood character, always seems to leave room for boards to make subjective decisions. Shouldn't be left to specific regulations and zoning code to help create or maintain character and leave that out of the decision-making process. And that would obviously require some change to the test overall, but doesn't that community character leave a lot of wiggle room for subjectivity when addressing a question or not? It's an excellent question, um, but the answer is actually fairly nuanced um, because as you can see in Matter of Bonefish Grill, the one that's up on the screen right now, ZBA member knowledge of the area is important, meaning it is a factor, right? But what they're saying here is not just, um, you know, I think, you know, I think the community character is, you know, I don't know, um, Victorian uh, style, and I like it that way. I mean, that's highly opinionated. Here, you can see that the ZBA knowledge was, I travel that, it, likely, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating, but my guess would be, it would, some, it would sound something like, um, I travel that area at eight o'clock and five o'clock every day uh, because I'm an accountant on that street, and this is my experience, and I happen to know, that I can't get a spot. And so we're tying um, ZBA member knowledge to a specific experience that's objective um, of you know, the high parking demand, as opposed to, um, so an example of that in the community character context would be something like um, someone who wanted to put a, so in an area variance context, uh, Use variance is a little bit different because that's just a, a completely different scenario. But in you know here we're talking about somebody wanted to um, you know seek an area variance. If the I think the the best example that's the easiest is a height restriction, right? So everything is a low sort of three story buildings, you know, kind of just you know kind of historically, and somebody wants to do six, right? I you know. I've lived here all my life, you know, we, the skyline looks like this, you know, I have an office on the third floor, I look out to the Adirondacks, you know, putting that building right here seems inconsistent with the entirety of the character of this entire downtown or whatever that might be, but citing to the other buildings along the street, you know, you're tying it to objective observations of why it's inconsistent, not six-story buildings are ugly, they look like Manhattan, and we're not Manhattan, is different. Is that, am I drawing that distinction enough? I mean, if that's where the ZBA member knowledge of the community is still based in their 
empirical knowledge, not their subjective aesthetics, what they like and don't like. Does that make, am I answering that? Yeah, I, I think I understand where you're, where you're coming from. Hopefully that, that carries. Personal the preference is different than that doesn't fit in here because every other building that I've ever looked at in my neighborhood is this height and that would be inconsistent. Um, you know, and again, in an area, and I wanted to say, and then from the legal analysis, that's why a zoning uh, area variance test is balancing. That's why you never leave it on one particular element alone. You, you look at all five so that the court is looking at the blending and on balance, does it just not work? You'd never leave, I hope, a zoning, a zoning analysis to just, it fails on community character. Yeah. Saying don't do that. And I think one thing that's very good for Zoning Board of Appeals members to do when they're looking at that first test for community character is refer back to the comprehensive plan. What are your community's goals for that area? In the, in the reference to building height, is it a transit use? Does, it, does your comprehensive plan talk about building density along transit lines? Because that speaks to um, the desire of a community to modify their zoning to implement better transportation practices or density or to, you know, uh, programs to increase the tax base. So I, my, my advice is look back at your comprehensive plan that should provide you with clues. A good comprehensive plan should provide you with clues as to what the community intends the character to be. Well, I think that's true, except for the fact that the, the zoning board is there to vary from the land use plan. It's the planning board right. to implement the land use plan. It's the zoning board's job to deem whether an owner is allowed to vary from the plan. They, they have almost opposite functions. Yeah, and although you're looking, at the, context, you're looking it's at the, the it's how the applicant's job. That it's the app and, and well, I just want to be fair. It's the applicant's job to prove to the ZBA there that they are entitled to do that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not it's out to be just given. Um, so it's a, they're high standards, they're high burdens. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, for me, I, I can count on one hand the number of use variance cases I've ever taken in my career. I mean, they're just not, they're just not, they're just not out for, they're not easy cases to make. They're not ones that are made often. They're, they're really challenging and for all the right reasons. Oh, for use variances, yes. Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, Character within the area variance. Yeah, that's different, but yeah, but um, you know, when you're about to make a case to a zoning board that I should be able to use this property other than the intended uh, comprehensive plan and, 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 and zoning code of how the, the community has intended the uses to be, it's a, it's a big lift. Yeah, yeah. On, on the use side, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Was there were more questions? Are we, I didn't know. Nope. Nope. Sorry to. No worries. Oh, no. This is there. Okay. So, oh, I just hit something there. Okay. Um, this is fine. What if the board agrees? So this is, um, this is always interesting if, uh, I see this, um, becoming more and more and more of a, of a tension point in public meetings. Um, so, uh, what if the board agrees with the, uh, the applicant or the owner's, uh, information? So it's very, very, um, uh, interesting. So here, um, or excuse me, agrees with the with the uh, the public opposition. I'm sorry, I had this one backwards. The next one's different. Feinberg Smith Associates versus the Town of Vest Vestal B Z B A. So the applicant wants to expand its student housing by adding 220 to 240 one to two bedroom apartments, which would result in 340 new residents near the Binghamton University campus. The total project would then be 409 apartments with 562 residents. So pretty substantial project on the university level. The applicant requests variances from the ZBA, ZBA to reduce the lot size requirements, reduce the minimum living space, reduce the number of required parking spaces and increase the allowable building height. We just talked about that, right? The ZBA receives over 80 written submissions and heard expansive public comment in opposition to the size and scope of this proposal. So large public um, scrutiny over a very substantial project. So after all of this deliberation, the ZBA denies the variances on three grounds. One, there would be a deleterious impact on the character of the neighborhood. Again, citing the height and scope and size. The relief was too substantial and there are less impactful alternatives available. So this is what we were just talking about, Martin. 
the applicant challenged the determination as purely based on community pressure. So the applicant says, you just caved the EBA to all of this, and the court did not agree. Instead, finding that while there was evidence to support the approval of the variance, meaning the, uh, the applicant goes into court and says, but wait a minute, wait a minute, I submitted all this evidence that there, you know, there wouldn't be this deleterious impact on the character of the neighborhood, that the relief wasn't substantial, that there, you know, there was, there was no less impactful alternatives. Like I gave all this empirical data and the court says too bad because there was equal evidence in the record to support a denial and the ZBA gets to pick. That's their job. And the court won't supplant its opinion for that of the ZBA at the local level because the ZBA is the finder of fact. So when there is evidence in the record, the court will be, for the most part, we'll talk about some later on where the court won't be, but for the most part, the court will be deferential because what they consider is the ZBA to be the closest to the community, the closest to the actual impact of land use decisions as a finder of fact. So if that evidence does exist and it's a close call, meaning the applicant has submitted evidence that could be construed and the opposition has submitted evidence that can be construed, ZBA gets to pick and they can pick to agree with opposition so long as that evidence exists. And so here, um, I don't know if I brought this with me. This is the one where, um, did I, let's see here. No, I'm not sure, but I, this, I'm not sure if it was this one or the other one, but the alternative, it might be in the materials. Let me see if I can flip to that quickly. I think that's an important piece. I just might not have brought it in the, uh, yeah, here it was. This is in your materials. I know this is the court specifically noted that the denial of the variances would not render the property unusable. So the applicant had taken this position that, well, if you don't grant this, I can't use it because the, the, opposition had found a way to show that there was a way to build the project code compliantly with five bedroom units. And because this was a university-based housing, that you could actually put five university students together in a suite type format and still meet the same demand. So um, what I'm basically saying is the opposition did their homework and submitted, it, submitted a, a functional plan. So um, in those circumstances, the board, the board was entitled to agree. So I hope that helps um, that sort of uh, opposition plus one, opposition plus empirical data how, is, is the standard. All right, so this is the big one, sort of the role of rumors. Um, you know, this is something that kind of comes up um, a lot these days in social media, um, especially when there is this creation of um, uh, blogs and Facebook groups and this, these places where information is passed, um, but is oftentimes unvetted and unsubstantiated. And so what is a board supposed to do when there are th there is information flying at them in a public forum or in public uh, comment or in written, in written submission? that may or may not be substantiated. What do you do, you know? So here, the petitioners applied to the ZBA for an interpretation, whether they were considered specialty trade contractors under the relevant ordinance and therefore permitted to engage in con concrete aggregate recycling activities on their property. I'm embarrassed to say that I don't quite know what that is. So if anybody does, I'm willing to be educated, but I'm not quite sure. But after obtaining a positive interpretation, the petitioners applied to the planning board for site plan approval. So that means that the code enforcement officer says uh, positive, meaning yes, you can go forward. Uh, they apply for site plan approval. The planning board then directs the applicant to file an amended application about whether their concrete aggregate recycling act also include the processing of raw materials. So they're asking for an interpretation of whatever processes the planning board is seeing in the application. So after holding a hearing, the ZBA denied the petitioner's application and concluded that they did intend to process raw materials at the site. This is a fascinating case to read, by the way. Um, and then they were not specialty trade contractors within that meaning, and then consequently they were ineligible to apply for a special use permit now required of specialty, specialty trade contractors. So in reversing the ZBA, the court found that the decision that the petitioners would process raw materials was irrational, as there was no evidence to support such claims and it was in direct contravention 
of the applicant's testimony. The claim that they intended to process raw materials was nothing more than a baseless rumor espoused by an angry public at the meetings that comes from the decision. Note, the case of Lemon versus the Town of Waterloo Town Board and the Town of Waterloo Planning Board noted again correctly that neither the Town Board nor the Planning Board may interpret a local zoning law, but only the Code Enforcement Officer may do so and that such interpretation must be appealed to the ZBA before a court may review it. And I know every time I come out to do a presentation, that is one of the most challenging aspects. So I bring these cases with me because I know it's, it's really, really um, hard sometimes because uh, planning boards may not understand, they may not agree with a code enforcement officer's decision, may not agree with a zoning board's interpretation, uh, they may not understand why they have to review a site plan application or a special use permit application um, that doesn't make sense to them. Uh, and they want to do that type of interpretation analysis or that type of denial. And it is absolutely not within the purview of the, the regulatory framework in New York to do that. There are ways to solve it and there are ways to draw your code to, to, change, to, to fix those things. But in the general framework outside of local code um, sections or local code framework that's not allowed. So here you see this happening um, in this town of Cortland matter. But what's more important, I think, at least with respect to what we're talking about today, is you have an applicant go in and give sworn testimony about what they intend to do on site and People are passing rumors through Facebook, through um, essentially uh, non-public or what I call now the quasi-public forum um, that know, you know, I know what they do at this other site. I know what they do over here. I've heard this. They've been cited by the state for this. You know, all kinds of public testimony um, that was in direct, um, that, that, that just made unfounded, irrational claims, but didn't have any basis. And, and in the law, we would call it hearsay testimony. Um, that in, essentially, which means um, I'd like you to accept my um, assertions of my assumptions as truth, uh, even though I don't have truth from my own personal knowledge. So that's, that's a kind of a that's sort of a basic uh, summary of hearsay, but but essentially, um, I've heard a rumor, and I want you to credit it, to discredit this testimony that this person has sworn to under oath. That is the role of rumors, and it will be reversed. And so, if a zoning board is going to take testimony, and that's where I sort of say apples to apples, then if you're going to ask an applicant to testify as to facts um, and sworn testimony, then any other testimony that you're going to credit at that same level needs to also be sworn testimony from personal knowledge. Otherwise, they don't, they're not that same thing that we just saw in the Feinberg-Smith case where the zoning board had equal evidence and got to pick. In this case, you have rumor against sworn testimony. That's not balanced evidence you can't there's no credibility resolution there one is considered credible evidence and the other one is considered rumor so just understanding that um specifically at the zoning board level because as we talked about those are quasi-judicial decisions so um and that goes for the zoning board too but um particularly this this particular case and this the taking of testimony tends to be more of a zoning board function you see that more um, specifically as it relates to pre-existing non-conforming uses, interpretation analysis, um, and uh, variance analysis, the planning board less so, but I don't, I, I guess there's circumstances where that could come up. Okay, next. Oh, public opinion versus traffic experts. I know we all have seen this. So this is the matter of 7-Eleven versus the incorporated village of Mineola. Just going to watch time here. Uh, a convenience store chain sought a special use permit to construct a store on, on the premises. The Board of Trustees held a public hearing on the application where the applicants presented experts to establish that there was no exacerbation of traffic issues or a decrease in market values. And likely it is that that's where, those were some of the elements of the special use criteria upon which uh, they're issued in the village. 
Um, and I want to just take a moment and, and say that every uh, town, not every, but but across the state, special use permits are handled by um, a variety of different boards. They can either be held by the legis, they can be reviewed by the legislative body, the zoning board of appeals, or planning board. It, it does depend. So if you're seeing this and confused, it's just it depends on the local the local ordinances. In response, the board members and members of the public referenced the clientele of the store as unsavory. Never a word you want to credit in a decision. And that traffic conditions would worsen if the special use permit was issued. However, no experts or proof was provided to support the contrary position. The board voted to deny the special use permit and the applicants appealed. In reversing the board's decision, the second department found that the conclusion the pro store would, fa would fail to comply with the applicable legislative imposed conditions and the determination was arbitrary and capricious. So, so essentially uh, the court cited the lack of support in the record that the exacerbating traffic conge congestion was directly contra 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 contradicted the experts' opinions. I see you there, Mark. <laughs> Hi. And of course my phone is ringing when I come off mute. We That's all right. Uh, what if the applicant has engaged in, this, I'm just going to read this as it's written. What if the applicant oh. engaged in prior behavior that if engaged in the current situation would adversely impact the intent of the ordinance? So this goes to the applicant's behavior. Yeah. There are cases on this. Um, I'm not going to, you know, um, the, the, these cases, there, there, there are tons and tons of cases on enforcement and whose job it is to enforce prior bad acts and the, the relative in powers of um, enforcement versus regulation. And so, um, you know, the, the, the review bodies of the planning boards and the zoning boards, and, and, and again, all the regulatory boards are not enforcement or penal bodies. You know, this is not minority report where, you know, you can think about the future of someone's crimes. It's just not what these boards are for. And there's actually a case in here where we're going to talk about that involving, it's actually involving 7-Eleven. It might actually be the next case. But if there is a lack of enforcement in your municipality um, with a prior applicant, the issue is with enforcement. It's not the job of the zoning board or the planning board to, and in fact, you will be reversed. For, for enforcement through uh, denying regulation because it's not a ground um, in, in, your, in your review purview. Is it, is it fair to say judge the application, not the applicant? Because that's, that's absolutely the law in New York on every, in every single way. There's a couple of exceptions. There might even be one in here uh, where you can tie it to the identity of the applicant. But generally speaking, land use decisions are land, not person decisions. Yeah, it works in reverse too. If, if everyone's talking about what a great person the applicant is, that applicant can sell the project. The, the, the moment after the decision is made to anyone and you have no ability to enforce against that decision. So yeah. that's right. It's arbitrary by its yeah. nature. So Thanks. that's of course. So, so in this 7 Eleven decision, because there's two, but this is the, the Mineola one, um, the other two that I brought. This is again where you see this. this this disparate um, type of evidence where uh, you have the public concluding that, uh, well, the, the, the uh, excuse me, this is here is the Board of Trustees concluding based upon public, public testimony or sort of public opposition that there are unsavory clientele, there is unsavory clientele, that the traffic conditions are just gonna get worse, um, but there's no evidence of either of those conclusions, they're conclusory on their face. Um, and they directly contradict what's been submitted in the record by what they call empirical evidence or the traffic engineer who says that's not true. Um, and certainly zoning based upon the identity of the clientele is um, void on its face for how you could impose conditions around zoning decisions. So we don't zone around identities of individuals. So, um, so the note here is that generalized community objection is never a reason on its own to deny an application. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's objective plus one. So it's, um, you, can, you can certainly take a community objection into account, but it never on its own can be the reason. 
Okay, next, uh, what is considered evidence then? So here is Sarah uh, Serata Smithtown LLC versus the Town of Smithtown Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, so here, this is one of my favorite cases because it's so instructive about where evidence comes from and, and, and uh, what the rise of social media and, and the internet has done. So here's a Sonic franchise that's met with this outpouring of resistance to propose it's a new restaurant in Smithtown. Um, I call it the Sonic case, even though it didn't apply under that name, it applied under the Smithtown LLC, but it was a Sonic franchise. In any event, um, so here, they need a special use permit and a series of variances to, to construct the store in this district. And they, the evidence they present um, uh, says, okay, the empirical data shows the real estate values will not be affected. Lighting is in compliance with the town code. All parking and traffic within recommended guidelines and the noise from the restaurant would be well below audible thresholds. Now, in opposition, the public or neighbors submit newspaper clippings, photographs, YouTube videos, and documents from websites concerning problems attendant to a sonic in the adjacent town in the town of North Babylon, I think operated by the same LLC. So this was this question about, well, what if this other person owns something else that's already in violation or contradicts their evidence or whatever, whatever, whatever. So apparently North Babylon was experiencing loud radios, drunken teenagers, long traffic lines at its new store where Smithtown residents were concerned would occur if this were granted. So here you see, you know, this ZBA being asked to be the enforcement arm for the town of North Babylon, which is not even where this is uh, pending. Um, and this I see, uh, you know, as, as a, again, and I fully, I fully admit that I'm a developer's attorney, you know, I, I don't try to hide anything there, you know, that is what I do, but I sit in a lot of meetings and I listen. And one of the things that I see is, you know, boards listening to a lot of complaints over which they don't have any jurisdiction. You know, some of these, these, these airing of grievances are, you know, that some of these problems are legitimate. It's just that there isn't anything this particular body can do about it because the jurisdiction of the boards are statutorily um, set forth. Their jurisdiction is limited. And so that's such an important thing to remember. So here, um, I love this the decision written by the Supreme Court here. Um, you know, the appellate division uh, did come down on this and agree, but the Supreme Court decision is just better by way of length and, and its detail. So the Supreme Court authors this excellent decision that takes a step-by-step -step analysis of the special use permit standard and says, while the reviewing board retains some discretion to evaluate each application for a special use permit to determine whether the criteria has been met and make some common sense judgment in deciding whether a particular application should be granted, such determination must be supported by substantial evidence. You still have to have evidence. And here, it is clear that the board's denial of the special use permit and the variances was arbitrary because it was based upon data from another restaurant in a neighboring town, which was problem, which, um, which problems would be created as evidence uh, as evidenced by the applicants and the town's own empirical data. So it was, it was completely contrary to the, the empirical data submitted by the applicant. And notably, the court also pointed out that denying a special use permit application because of the characteristics necessarily inherent to the business itself, i.e. counter service, is equally irrational. This is something that's really, really important, I think, to hear, um, especially in the rise of community opposition, which is if the use is permitted or even specially permitted in the zone, the legislative body has considered the use and its intended impacts as uh, allowed. This is not a use variance. So the idea that the characteristics of counter service, like a sonic, if it's contemplated in the allowable or specially permitted uses is a presumptive finding of compliance or inherently part of the characteristics of doing business in that zone. So it can't be denied, a special use permit can't be denied on those grounds. It's inherently inconsistent with saying it's specially permitted. So that's a, that, that, inherent, that will be considered inherently irrational. 
So if you're citing to the characteristics of the business itself that are tantamount to the definition, your, though those reasons are going to be considered irrational, even if the public finds it a problem. All right, more on what's considered evidence. How am I doing on time? 11.26, okay. What's considered- Doing great on time. I got a, I got a question that may require more nuance. Okay. I, I understand the, the, the courts over the denial based upon, if I'm articulating this correctly, uh, based upon the community concerns about some of those uh, activities that were taking place at the, the other Sonic. So loud music, drunk teenagers, I think I saw in the text. Um, when we're talking about a special use permit, it often comes down to operations at the business like the handling of waste or noise or offensive smells that the community has the ability to define when they're providing the special use permit. If it doesn't come down to a matter of enforcement, does I, this is a two part question. Does the community have uh, ability through the special use permit to put very clearly that um, they consider these um, uh, these impacts of this business. And two, if that's the case, doesn't the community have the ability to, through that special use permit process, to actually regulate those things? Okay. The land yeah. use board. I All right. I want to draw, I want to draw a couple of distinctions and forgive me because I, I am a lawyer, so I have to do that. One no, that's what, <laughs> that's why you're really here. clear. <laughs> this case, this case involved a denial of a special use permit, right? not a regulation. So this was a wholesale denial, not the imposition of conditions. So I wanna draw that distinction because that's very, very important. This was a town saying, no, you can't even locate here, not we're gonna impose reasonable conditions on how you locate here, all right? That's a complete cave. What they're saying in Serrata Smith Town, this is a complete cave to community opposition. This is a complete cave based on no evidence in the record. I don't view that as the same thing as saying, all right, I'm a reasonable planning board. I'm looking at your business operations. My job is to look at, you know, how your particular business operations um, impact the way, you know, the, the way that I've been asked to review this as far as the special use permit criteria go and try to mitigate as best that I can the impacts on the, the, the neighborhood. Right, yeah. I, I, I was speaking more to a, a previous case you had talked about the limited yeah. authority that boards of zoning, board of zoning appeals members and, and planning board members have an actual administration of, um, of regulating those businesses. But they actually do have a kernel of authority in the fact that when it comes to a special use permit, they can place some conditions on a business to. Sure to help reinforce the public's expectations of how the business will operate. Yeah, I think we have that next. Uh, that might be this one, it's this one. But um, the reasonableness of the conditions is where uh, you'll find this planning boards and the special use permits. Um, you know, I have one case, I don't remember which one it is, but um, it's one of my seven, it's one of, oh no, it's the Bonefish Grill case um, mm -hmm. it says, uh, you could be a restaurant as long as you're not a restaurant. <laughs> Where it was like, you can't be open on Saturdays, uh, only for lunch. Like there was like so much. That, like, so I try to give examples of cases that are so, that are just, you know, that are so obvious to try to prove the point. But mm -hmm. I mean, I think uh, you can put set reasonable conditions so long as they aren't, they don't take the legs out of the use that's specially permitted. That, is that answering your question? And that's what the town failed to failed to do. Right. In, so right. Board, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's absolutely the planning board's job to cite the specially permitted use in a way that still maintains the use itself as contemplated by the legislative body, while doing what it can reasonably to harmonize the impacts with the surrounding community. So I think that's the way I'd say it. Thanks. All right. 
This is also one of my favorite. I have a lot of favorite cases. I say that a lot. So what is considered evidence again? So this is Blanchfield versus Husick. So this is a dog trainer who received her uh, a notice from the town that her business violated the town code and that a special use permit site plan were required for her dog training business. The local ordinance said, uh, provided that some noise coming from her property could not exceed 80 decibels. So the owner, I love this, is like so, like such ingenuity. She's also a registered nurse, uh, provided daily, she, she got like somehow she got registered or she got certified and being able to take decibel sound readings. Um, and so she provided these readings, she took them for a month during daily interviews intervals. She kept a record. She had the distance from her property line marked to her training kennels uh, over the course of this month at uh, I think sun, sunrise and sunset. And it showed decibel readings of no more than 70. So she was within compliance of, um, of the town ordinance. Now, one of her neighbors produced an audio recording that was taken from the front porch of his house coming from the applicant's property, he alleges, with his iPhone. And another neighbor who operates a horse training business sent letters in complaining of dog noise. Now, the applicant, you know, even in the face of this op opposition, offers to move her pens um, so that they would be blocked by the building. She agreed to erect a sound blocking stockade fence, but still the ZBA says, nope, we're going to deny your special use permit, citing insufficient mitigation measures. Now, she sues and the court reverses the ZBA because the applicant's scientific evidence, her decibel readings, went uncontroverted in the record. And the board improperly relied on unsubstantiated sound recordings. So again, which thing is not like the others? So here, she submitted, the nurse submitted certified um, empirical daily sound recordings with a decibel um, uh, with with decibel readings that could be verified and replicated uh, with appropriate distancing, all of which were um, were scientific. And the op the opposing evidence was one an audio recording from an iPhone with um, you know no type of scientific support and the subjective opinion of the uh, horse training business um, just complaining. And so because those, you know, which two things are not like, you know, which things are not like the others, these two things didn't match, the court said, you know, she didn't have to, you know, that's, a, that's an unfair denial. Um, what's important here too, though, I think is, um, I was struck by this because uh, I was struck by the fact that even in the face of, of, um, of really, you know, I think, as I said, unsubstantiated evidence and complaints from her neighbors, she still offers to do what she can, which is really what special use permitting is all about, to do the maximum possible, and it wasn't enough. And I think um, that's something that, uh, you know, this, this, this court, I think really, I think it really, if you read the decision, sometimes you can read the subtext of decisions. I think this really bothered this court that, uh, here she was offering to, this was a appellate division level decision too. Here was a woman who ran a business um, and really tried to, even though she could demonstrate that she was not violating the town noise ordinance, uh, was still offering to do neighborly things and it wasn't good enough. Um, that's the kind of thing I think, even in the subtext, really bothered the court. So uh, they instituted her special use permit, um, which you don't see courts often do. They didn't send it back, um, they, they issued it. So just something to keep in mind. All right, next, who is permitted to object? This is the matter of 7-Eleven versus the town of Babylon. Uh, this is more of like uh, standing issues. And I don't know how often these come up, but I always bring a standing um, case just so that uh, we at least have the discussion. So here um, in the precedent of matter of 7-Eleven versus the village of Mineola, which is a case we talked about a minute ago, a proposed convenience store was denied a site plan approval due to uh, the planning board's finding that the proposal could not protect the health, safety, and welfare of pedestrian site access and neighboring properties. By the way, a very rare thing to have a site plan denied for health and safety. It's one of the only grounds that you'll ever see a site plan denied. Uh, but the review of the facts of the case reveals no less than four separate site plan revisions to address concerns 
of the traffic access, truck deliveries and limited delivery hour, hours. When, and the reason I brought that up is to say that that's how many times the applicant went back trying to address um, objections being brought up by the public. Um, so the town, so the town, I, and I usually highlight the things that I think really drove the court's decision. The town received a letter from a competing 7-Eleven franchise owner who owned a store less than a mile away, indicating that 7-Eleven, 7-Eleven, the, the, uh, the um, franchisor could not restrict truck deliveries to box trucks only, no matter what deed restrictions were signed. So basically what had happened was the, the uh, franchisee had produced his deed restrictions that said, here's a deed from my franchisor, we will not you know, accept anything other than box trucks. And this guy who owns a competing 7-Eleven's like, oh, I don't care what that says. Uh, I know because I'm a franchise owner, they can't do that. That's not true. Again, unsubstantiated testimony. So there was, of course, significant neighbor outcry about the impacts to the surrounding neighborhood and the traffic increases. So the applicant, um, uh, you know, again, agrees to these deed restrictions concerning the timing and size and scopes of the deliveries, uh, submits an ex expert traffic study and the engineering support to the project and the planning board votes to deny the site plan as revised, finally. Citing to the letter from the other franchise owner and that the site could not be developed safely without uh, impact to health and safety, again, something you rarely see. The second department reverses and cites the Mineola case as precedent concerning the denial of a special use permit, largely based on community objection. A few points the court makes deserve note. One, the planning board failed to articulate how this permitted use would be any more impactful of a site than any other permitted use in the commercial zone. I want to pause there for a second because I think this is, when I first read this decision, and this one is, uh, let's see here, just a few, I think it was 2015, 2015, it's not in my notes, but that's what my, 2017, excuse me, so it's only a few years old. I, when I read this decision, I thought nobody, this is going to, this is going to end up being one of the most impactful decisions that's come down, um, because what that note is really saying, that number one, is that when planning boards are looking at traffic impacts, really what this decision did was add a new criteria through case law. And it, it maybe not new because you can find some of the older decisions that they're citing to, but really it, it brings it out in strong relief and says, even if your traffic report says it's going to impact traffic, if it's not going to impact traffic more than the other permitted uses that the legislative body has allowed in this commercial zone, that's not grounds to deny. Because the legislature has decided that those uses are permitted. So if they've decided that they're permitted, then they've contemplated traffic impacts. So you can't just say it's all gonna be green space because <laughs> that's not what the legislature said. And that would be the planning board zoning for the legislature. And I don't know how deeply that's been read and I've seen it come up a couple more times. I just think that's gonna, that, when I read that, I thought, ooh, that's gonna be big. Sorry, Martin, go ahead. I just think that's a, fant I just wanna echo, that's a fantastic way to read that. It's already been zoned this way. The community has already determined that the impact won't be substantial. So uh, what I think I wish people would understand the difference between traffic and congestion. Those are two things I think people should correct. Be. That's a, so that, that was my oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Oh. <laughs> so what you're what you're really doing, if you're really being savvy, is you're looking at the delta, the delta between the baseline of those uses in that commercial zone and what this use is going to is going to stack on top. So you actually have a baseline of not zero. Your baseline of traffic is that sort of what would that zone look like with sort of a, a commercial congestion contemplated by those uses or any one of them on that site. But you don't start with, with, with you know, a farm. Right. That's not true. And so that's what this case is saying, that that is an unfair standard and they won't sustain it. So I just want everybody to hear that because that's... Um, 
another big one if you're hearing the public's complaint on that, um, court's not going to agree with the public. So number two, the Mineola, in, Mineola involved a special use permit, which is an even more intensive municipal review than a site plan, which means there must be even more compelling data as to why it cannot be approved. So that's another thing to, uh, to take a look at. Uh, the use of a competitor's, okay, this is important, a competitor's subjective unsworn assessment was not sufficient to counter the volumes of empirical data submitted by the applicant. Again, looking for that imbalance between what an objection uh, is supported by versus what the applicant or the owner has submitted by way of empirical data. And four, reliance on conclusory and speculative concerns will not be sustained. So um, just looking at that too, um, where is it conclusory? It is because it is because it is, it's conclusory. Um, and, and drawing conclusions, um, looking for those logical conclusions that don't, uh, where there could be other conclusions drawn um, is, is very, very important. So, um, okay. So I just want to point that out again. I, I kind of skipped over number two um, that uh, that site plan. If you're denying a site plan, I, I, again, I just just bring this up from my own anecdotal experience. That um, site plan really does have. Uh, I've seen it sustained once. I think I'm just kind of going back through my. I'm getting older now, but um, but I think I've seen it sustained one time denying a site plan based upon health, uh, safety and welfare restrictions. And it was because the site plan was a dirt track with um, like jumps. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but like a motor bike track. And it was adjacent to a daycare or some type of child facility. And the jumps were of a trajectory that it was possible from physics that somebody could hit it, a mountain bike or dirt bike at such a speed that they could crash, they could literally end up in the adjacent property. And for that reason, the site plan was not safe. But unless you're seeing that level, it's, it's challenging to deny a site plan uh, that I've ever seen it sustained. Usually there, there, there are, you see towns and applicants trying to work together to create a safe site plan. So um, if you're coming to the point as a planning board where you're about to deny a site plan, pull this case out. Um, okay. Next is uh, how must the public be heard? So now we're going to start getting into some of those procedural things, and I didn't want to miss those. This is the matter of Fergal to Fergo. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. With the Town of Richfield Planning Board. So here, this is an open meetings law case. Uh, this is a case of citing um, six wind turbines. Um, so originally, the planning board gave a notice of its public hearing and meeting to take place at Town Hall. This may be a little bit antiquated because this case came out before COVID, but we're going to come back. So anyway, I, I still think it has a good, uh, a good message um, for, for towns and for, for people who work in the, the public notice world. Um, the planning board gave notice of its public hearing and the meeting was to take place at town hall and indicated that the project would be the focus of the meeting. And of course, six wind turbines is a you know, huge public turnout resulted in exceeding its mac maximum occupancy. So the town attorney announces that the meeting would be moved to a church two blocks away that had greater capacity. So a note's placed on town hall door to say to the, you know, to the latecomers, we've moved and we're going to start an hour later to let everybody travel over. And of course, somebody objected because I think, the, you know, the project gets approved and someone says, oh, that's an open meetings law violation. So the Supreme Court annuls the planning board resolution approving the project because of the violation of the open meetings law, finding that the board should have anticipated a larger crowd and made the better arrangements. And the Pell Division says, no, no, the board took the efforts necessary to relocate the meeting in light of all reasonable, reasonable in light of all the circumstances, they saw the large crowd, they put the note on the door, they try to accommodate the capacity, they start an hour later, you know, they do everything they possibly can. So they, the public body makes, because the public officer's law only requires the public body make or cause to be made all reasonable efforts to ensure that the meetings are held in an appropriate facility that can adequately accommodate members um, of the public, sorry about my typo, of the public who wish to attend such meetings. So I just think that's, you know, that should give us all a little bit of comfort, you know, that, that we try, that as long as, uh, as public officials are doing what they can to accommodate the size and the timing and all of those kinds of things um, to allow the public to be heard, uh, generally speaking, the court will, ooh, the court will um, allow for that. So I think 
um, you know, those are, so that's, that's where I had um, sort of the, uh, the slide presentations, but there are, if you, if you have questions, I'll happily answer them. The materials contain um, more, um, you know, more uh, things that we can talk about. I think that there is um, uh, one in particular that I would like to bring up if I have time, Martin. Do I have time to bring up? You do, on? yes, yeah. Okay, so one is the, um, um, one involves, that I think that's sort of important to mention, um, this is the Allegheny Wind LLC case versus the Town of Planning Board of the Town of Allegheny. This is a fourth department case from 2014. I always, um, forgive me for my little quips inside my uh, summaries, but this one is entitled, Your Wind Makes Too Much Noise. Um, so I, you know, kind of like, what are these cases about? So in this- Is, is this one in the, um, the other document, the other materials? Because I yeah. can- my yeah, I don't have, like, I didn't bring all my slides because I wasn't sure how long it would go, but I always bring enough, I always bring materials because I always have lots of cases I always want to talk right. about. Right. So, in, is this the one you're talking about? Oh, you can bring it up? Yeah, it's on page yeah. four. Okay. Technology. This is Feinberg. Oh, it's not on my page. Let's see here. I think okay. it's a little more. <laughs> oh, it's one. Okay, one, two, Allegheny three. Win. Yeah. If we can get to it. Neola, Town of Allegheny. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we'll make these materials available. So if people are struggling to read it on the screen or a device, don't worry. These will be available um, through the Eventbrite page. So you can read it there um, and don't feel like you have to strain to read this. It's the context that Libby's sharing that's, that's the most critical part. So, so here, um, these have to do with the way in which um, we allow. Um, the process to kind of proceed and what role citizens groups play in um, challenging projects. Because um, for those of you who haven't been part of citizen group litigation, um, it can be, uh, you know, it can be, I think, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it can be overwhelming because um, I don't know if anybody saw this, but one of the most interesting cases of the year came down yesterday involving citizens group. Um, so the case against the New York State Department of DEC and Parks and Rec came down yesterday. Did, I, oh, Parks, sorry. It, Moved it, off my screen. There you go. Sorry. Did you, I don't know if you saw the decision, but the Court of Appeals yesterday um, blocked. Oh, regarding the, about the snowmobile trails. Correct. So the, is it 420 acres of uh, snowmobile trails in the Adirondack Park uh, was blocked yesterday by the Court of Appeals. Um, because of uh, four, actually. There might be more, but there were three, three citizens group and one amicus curiae, a group who got together and, um, and actually um, basically made a constitutional or New York State constitution challenge um, on the preservation of parklands, the forever wild sections of the New York State to object to the state's um, plans, or the, I shouldn't say the state, but the state department's plans to uh, cut down over a thousand trees to create these. Um, so anyway, the role that citizens play and citizen groups play in New York state land use can rise to that level, can rise to blocking not only um, private applicants, but also the state's plans to do things as well. So I just wanna say that this is, um, this is an important relationship between you know, government and, uh, and people and, and is something that plays out on all different levels. So anyway, I just wanted to say that an important case came down yesterday at the highest level in New York. So um, it'll be it, will be, it, will, it remains to be seen whether uh, the state will seek a constitutional amendment to that forever wild section to allow the snowmobile trails to go forward. But that is the only remedy left, at least from what I see. In any event, um, here in the Allegheny case, in 2011, uh, the applicant received a special use permit to operate 29 wind, uh, wind, uh, 29 turbine wind farm in the town of Allegheny. And the planning board required the commencement of construction within one year. So you'll see that in special use permits, that sort of temporal requirement or that sunsetting inside a special use permit. Um, and the reason for that is because circumstances of the review and the conditions and things can change and planning boards want that ability to be able to bring it back to keep looking at it, because we talked about it a minute ago, the siting of a project inside a special use permit has to do with the surrounding community. But anyway, in the meantime, 
the citizen group files an action opposing the project and the applicant applies for an extension, right? They say, okay, well, wait a minute, I just got sued. So I need, um, I need a year to sort of resolve this litigation with the citizens group. So please extend my special use permit time. So the planning board grants the, the, the extension, but only for a year um, or within 90 days of the conclusion of the citizen group lawsuit, right? So um, the lawsuit was dismissed within six weeks of its filing and the appeal was never perfected, which means it was never, all the papers weren't put together um, by the citizen group. Um, and so when the town, and when the town did move, the applicant threatened the town with legal action. So whenever, so when the town was advised by council for the citizen group of their intention not to proceed further, applicants council still refused to sign the stipulation discontinuance. And I said, anyone see a pattern here? Cause they were trying to stretch their time. <laughs> Anyway, by the time the applicant sought the extension, 90 days had long since passed after the termination of the lawsuit, and thus the applicant had to seek a new special use permit. So here, this time though, the planning board did not grant the special use permit because the applicant had switched the intended wind turbine models, which models would have increased the noise levels above the town ordinance um, restrictions. And as such, the court found that there was no equitable tolling in New York for land use approvals being challenged and that a significant change in the application permitted by the planning board allowed them to deny the request for an extension a second time. So here, um, what the important takeaway from this is that the, when I put in the parentheses, anyone see a pattern here, what was happening in that case was the applicant was benefiting from the, uh, de they had power, the applicant had power to extend the ending of the appellate process because they had to be a signatory to the stipulation of discontinuance, which ends a matter in New York State by stipulation, which also happened to be the tolling of that 90 days with the planning board. So they were delaying. And in the subtext of the decision, they were reworking their plans for these wind turbines, but not sort of disclosing that to the town. So when they came back, the planning board said, not only has your plans changed, but you basically strung, strung this out and we don't have to grant this to you. And the court sustained that. So <clears throat> there, the use of the citizen group challenge or the fact that the citizen group was suing them was being utilized to kind of string out this process. And here the court said, you know, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna allow that um, to happen. So, you know, I think there uh, you, you're looking at not letting an applicant get the benefit of their own delay tactics is something that, um, <clears throat> you know, you want to pay attention to uh, if, if they're wrangling, because uh, it does happen, you know, it's happened in, for my clients. I've had, you know, I've been through a lot of different uh, matters, but where, you know, one of my clients will have an issue with a citizens group on one side, you know, been sued and also trying to maintain with the town on the other, sort of a two front uh, aspect, but in no circumstance should um, the applicant be using one to benefit the other and vice versa. So that's just why I brought that one forward. Um, Martin, if we could go back up to Dutt versus Bowers, I think this is another uh, one that I didn't bring into the, to the, uh, to the PowerPoint, but I certainly bring it with me to my talk. Um, I have it at the top. There it is. This one is one of my favorites only because it's funny. So in Dutt versus Bowers, this is Suffolk County Supreme. So this is down on Long Island. So the owner hires Dunright Pools, and that'll end up being funny because the pool was done wrong. Um, but they install this freeform pool on this parcel in the town of Islip. So that's like one of those ones that's just sort of like this rambling pool design. That's sort of I don't even know what to describe it. You guys know what I mean, like amoeba. Anyway, so the cool the pool company measures the narrowest point of the pool to the northern boundary fence. Now, for my ZBA friends, you're going to know. I think you probably already have a sense of what's happening here. They measure to the fence, but not the property. Unfortunately, the fence was located eight feet north of the property line on the neighboring parcel and does not represent the correct marker. When the as-built survey is done and submitted to the town, the side yard setback violation is noted, right? So the ZBA hears the application and denies the variance request on several grounds, including self-created hardship, impact to the neighborhood, precedential effects, substantiality, alternatives, you name it, all five plus, you know, I don't know, the kitchen sink. Anyway. So the owner commences this article 78, seeking a judgment, vacating and annulling the zoning board determination and says, you know, Jesus is really unfair. The pool company put this in here. You know, what am I gonna do? So in considering all the evidence and balancing the totality of the circumstances, the court says that the zoning board had no explanation or support 
from the evidence for their determination that the pool would produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. Now, remember, the pool was built entirely on the owner's property. It just, it's just a setback violation. Um, and the court says, look, there's these pools all over this neighborhood. So they have this aerial, you know, they look down, they see these pools everywhere. Um, there wouldn't be a detriment to nearby property owners. Everything is screened. This is a very, like, what they describe in the decision is this forested community. There's trees everywhere. Um, there's, no, there's no evidence of an impact to the health, safety, and welfare of the community. It's pool, or that it would create an unwarranted precedent. This was the only one of four oversized lots in the area um, where a pool could even exist. So there's no way it could be recreated. So finally, the court notes noted that the one uh, that the condition was not self-created as it hired the excavator oh excuse me as it was the excavator hired by the contractor who created the zoning violation so as such the court held that the zoning was not rationally based on the so they basically they annulled the vate then they remit it back to the zoning board to make a determination not inconsistent with their findings so the thing that's important here again is we look at subtext and what is the court really saying in dutt versus bowers besides you know make sure you have hire a reputable pool company but is that you know, I I brought this one because I see this a lot is zoning boards who get mad at people who make a mistake, and I get that because I know that there's a lot of people that come in to zoning boards and ask for forgiveness instead of permission, and I I totally understand that. I sit in a lot of meetings, I understand. However, what the court is saying here is there are circumstances where it is legitimately not the owner's fault. And if you're going to punish an owner, you still have to, you still have to use the five part test. You still have to, you still have to go through the analysis that the, that the, that the mistake that the owner made still in some, under the five part test results in enough to deny the variance. So that's the issue is it's, again, as I said a moment ago, you know, regulatory boards aren't there for enforcement and punishment, you're not court. So that's the, that's the part that I know can be hard, especially when, you know, the public comes in and wants to, uh, wants to be angry about this. But here, this pool just did not create the things that the area variance test is really looking for. And beyond that, the, the, the ZBA in this uh, Dutt versus Bauer case didn't even try. They didn't do any of it. They were just like, you know, he didn't pay any attention. They, you know, um, very conclusory kind of decision. So, um, and, and really what the court was saying was, if you're going to bring somebody in and punish them, then you better write the correct decision because this isn't it. So, um, so with that, um, I just think that's just something to remember for the, uh, forgiveness versus permission thing, because I know that's a real thing and I'm sensitive to it and I get it, but still got to apply the five-part test. So, anyway, I think with that, I'm out of time, but I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> I, I want to thank you. I didn't see any, any uh, additional questions in the chat function, and I want to appreciate you for um, for committing an hour and a half of your time for us. It's kind no of difficult to be a one-man band for such a such a long gig, but you said you're a lawyer and you, this is what you do. So I, <laughs> I get paid by the word. <laughs> um, so I, I do really uh, appreciate this. Um, we we have your contact information in your slideshow if anybody wants to reach out to you. We have archived these materials on the Eventbrite site um, so people can access them. Uh, we'll make the recording available at the conclusion of the series. So again, thank you so much. I got to give a plug for our next uh, session. Uh, that'll be farm friendly zoning to increase agricultural resiliency. And that'll take place at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, May 12th. That's one week. And our presenting sponsor for that session is Community Planning and Environmental Associates. And if you haven't signed up, uh, the link is on the Eventbrite page. If you do have any trouble signing up for any of our webinars, or accessing some information, or would like to contact some of our speakers, reach out to me, uh, you know, or CDRPC at cdrpc.org, and we can try to help folks um, navigate and track down some resources. So thank you again, Libby. Always appreciate you. I hope we can count on you in the fall, but I won't press it here if you're available. Um, but again, thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge and time with us. Of course. All thank right. You. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Great questions. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.